You know what's hot right now? Drone racing. Drone Racing League, today on After Drive. Hey, welcome to After Drive. It's Mike Spinelli, and we're talking about drones today. Drone Racing League is here. First of all, Andrew Seisloff, the new editor of Aerial, that drives drone coverage. You're going to be watching uh, and reading a lot more about drones on the drive. And also, Nicholas Horbachevsky yeah. from Drone Racing League. Um, thanks for coming in, man, because I've been kind of nerding out watching Drone Racing League videos. And I've only vomited like six times. So that's, that's really good. That's it's good. It's kind of fun. Put you no, in the middle of the bell curve. Yeah, yeah, oh. No, it's cool. I, you know, drone racing to me is sort of like, you know, it's jet fighters for regular people, kind of. You yeah. can just call it that. You can call it like if you, if you can't, you know, take a car in a racetrack um, in the air uh, and upside down. <laughs> then why not so try if you're drones? a normal person that can't do that. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> so um, first of all, tell me about Drone Racing League, um, and then we'll get into like drone racing, how to get involved, how to actually learn how to fly a drone. That's Andrew's uh, uh, coverage area on Man, the drive now. I'm, a, I'm all right. You're, you know, you've been doing some very good coverage on Aerial. It's called Aerial, thedrive.com slash Aerial, A-E-R-I-A-L. <laughs> Remember the E, because I usually forget the E. Um, <laughs> So, so tell me about Drone Racing League. How did it get started? Yeah, sure. So Drone Racing League is the global professional circuit for drone racing. Okay. So we put on a series of races with the top pilots in the world. We take it around the world. We have broadcast it all over the place, and we crown a world champion at the end of the year. So it's a lot like Formula One, but with drones. Basically. That's cool. I mean, obviously, yeah. it has to be a sport now because people are good at it, right? Yeah. So how did, I mean, when, when did drones as racing objects become a thing? I mean, because... You know, we talk about uh, drones for filming. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's people talk about drones delivering stuff and like maybe being, you know, leapfrogging the auto industry right. in uh, who, who knows how many years. Um, but what about how long has drone racing been around? How long have people have been doing it? It's a great question. It's it's a little hard to answer because it so it started we think about 5 or 6 years ago down in Australia. So there's these web posts by people building these really fast quadcopter drones and then putting a little camera on it that feeds a video back to a pair of goggles that the pilot wear. So the pilot can see what the drone sees. We like to say it's like sitting in the cockpit of the drone. And the minute you're doing that, you can race it in like a complex three-dimensional course, which you couldn't do before. And then over the course of five years or so, it just spread globally. So the game changer was being able to see where the drone's going because if obviously line of sight uh, gets harder and harder yeah. once the drones get faster and faster. Yeah, I think that's it. I think there were two things. I think the the cameras and the video feed, that first person view is essential to it. And also just the technology got cheaper, it got more reliable, and you saw this convergence of you know these small components, first person view, small radios, and suddenly people put it all together and said, wait, we can, we can race these things. Yeah, I mean, look at some of the footage, right? I mean, you like some of these race guys. I mean, I don't know. Are you are you a racer yourself? Or are you? I'm I'm a very bad racer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, some of the things, and we'll talk about like some of the moves. Yeah. Because it's it's mind blowing that first of all, um, that you can have the sort of presence of mind to yeah. make the drone do that while you're watching through a relatively low res camera. Yeah. Um, and uh, and also that uh, you have the kind of situational awareness to get a drone to flip so that you can corner better. Yeah. Like just this weird stuff. So Andrew, you, you've been doing this kind of drone, Drones 101 on the drive for a while. Yeah, and I've been flying about three years. And I also, I just want to say that that was like the most succinct way I've ever heard anyone explain drone racing before. I've never done I'm it like, before. First take. That was like Unreal. amazing, yeah. you know, because usually I'm like, well, there's a camera, but it's like not for filming. <laughs> yeah. But there is a camera that feeds into like a low latency signal. Um, I love it. I only got into racing about a couple years ago. And why I love it, because it, it like, I've liked motor racing for a while, but it's, it's way more accessible. I mean, what some people hear, they hear like the $1,000 entry fee, but like, or like, entry into drone racing. Yeah. But that's like nothing compared to cars. You know, right. like if yeah, you want yeah. if you want a day on a track, you need a car, you need to like be able to fix up a car even if you have like a beater that you want to take down there. So like you're spending a lot of money and this like even though you're spending a fair amount of change to get onto dr into drone racing, then it just doesn't compare to like taking a, a car to a field. So like I I got into it because like 
I, you know, went through my local chapter yeah. and um, there's a chapter. Oh yeah, yeah. there's what? like, like, like the there's like of? grassroots uh, yeah, a chapter it's like everywhere. Oh, it is crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Drum yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like um, Moto GPs. Oh no, um, Multi GP. Multi GP. Yeah. So there's a grassroots organization. They're all over the U.S. But then, you know, I was just in Japan, China, Hong Kong. Like there's organized drone racing everywhere globally. Wow. Yeah. But. Drone Racing League brought it to like an insane new level. Like if you see some of these maps, uh, they're just like neon lights through abandoned courses. I mean, it's just, it's really insane. Because like I, what I knew, as I was saying, like I, I knew these, I'd go to a park and I'd hang out and like grill with a bunch of friends. Yeah. And, you know, just race around some, some flags and yeah. sometimes indoor, some like micros and stuff. But seeing what you guys are able to produce in like stadiums and abandoned like, uh, what was it, a mall? Yeah, Banner Mall. I mean, it's just, it was insane. I, I don't even know how to explain it. It was like from my backyard to watching it on ESPN. It's yeah. really, it wasn't incredible. So I was like only sort of kidding about getting sick before, but like with VR, I know that's been a, you know, an issue for VR producers. I mean, is it an issue for drone racers to, is there something you have to get over? Like, is there a seasickness or air sickness, sort of weird air sickness thing? It's, it's, so it's different, right? So VR has this challenge you're trying to overcome, which is you put on these goggles and you're turning your head and it's rendering a world inside of it. And it's slightly slower than your head turns and your inner ear and your eye are like, wait, these don't sync. And you start to get nauseous. Drone racing, you're actually looking at a fixed camera point of view. So you're looking at a real signal. So when you turn your head, nothing happens. All that matters is if you turn the drone, the image turns. And so it doesn't make you, it doesn't give you this sort of VR sickness. But it, we do call it immersive though. So if you put on a pair of goggles and someone starts flying, your brain is just tricked. You think you are the drone. You think you are flying. So the pilots talk about like white knuckle fear flying and like they talk about if you crash and you hit a wall, you kind of have this like thump in your chest and you grab your chair because it's more your brain being fooled into thinking than that like, you know, seasickness kind of feeling. That's amazing. I think yeah. that to me is sort of a strange, it's sort of like the split between video games and real life. That's it. This yeah. strange yeah. sort of midway point. And for me, at least, you have to think that way. Because if you start thinking like, OK, I'm making this right, and I, I have to put my joysticks this way or my sticks this way, then you're not going to make it. Right. Like, it, it has to feel like you're flying, and it can't. It has to be second nature. Like, if you start thinking like what my inputs need to be, like, sure, you need to remember a course, but it has to be second nature, and you have to feel like you're flying in order to really race. I feel like. All right, so what does a drone race entail? So we call our events levels. So level one, LA uh, Miami Nights, level two, LA Apocalypse. So we call them, we give them sort of thematic names, and they do a number of races. So in our case, they'll do five races. So races are pretty short. They're like 60 to 90 seconds long. So people are surprised the first time they see the sport. Right. But what's fun about that is it means the pilots get a lot of tries at the course. Crashing is just part of this sport. Drones crash all the time. So about half the drones crash every time. So you earn points with every race, and then the top three from each group advance. We have some finals, and the top one, two, three finish uh, at the top of the level. So more than anything, actually, DRL is a technology company. So we designed and built our own drone from the ground up. We also designed the radio systems to control the drones, and a lot of the ancillary technology to facilitate things like tracking and scoring. Um, so it means that when we bring 500 drones to an event, they're all identical. Um, so every pilot is racing an identical high performance drone. That's interesting because, I mean, I didn't think about tracking and scoring and all that oh, stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's like because on a, you know, on a race car, obviously they have like, you know, radio, um, uh, tr you know, transponders and yeah. transmitters. What is, yeah, I mean, is it sort of the same thing or is it digital or like how do they track it? Well, so it's, it's, it's actually just sort of like an order of magnitude more challenging than race cars. So race cars have a few advantages. They're huge. They have a lot of power. So there's a lot of availability. So you can put something heavy and powerful on it. And they're never going to be more than a couple feet off the ground, at least not on purpose. So you, you have a lot of things going for you that you can basically look overhead and be like, the car is going to be somewhere on this line. Right. Drones, they can be anywhere in three-dimensional space. They can only carry a little bit of weight, and they don't have much available power on board. So you need completely different tools to solve this. We started by looking at all the tech they use for like F1 and NASCAR, and just none of it really applies to drones. We had to start over. So is it, yeah, that's, I mean, is it like laser, like do you use like laser uh, gates or anything? Like, or is there? So we don't use a lot of visual detection. We use a lot of sort of complex radio systems that allow us to determine where the drone is in space, how fast it's going. It's staying, honestly, just staying in communication with the drone is hard yeah. enough. That's interesting because, I mean, obviously, like, in radio, con 
controlled car racing, right? It's it's about having uh, you know whatever frequencies you're using. I mean, yeah. I, I don't I'm I'm no radio engineer, but like there, those that's a relatively complex situation. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I and mean, we have a bunch of like patents on radios. Like we had to basically throw out the rule book on on radios, even drone radios, and start over. Yeah. And you hear this sound obviously outside. We wanted to bring some drone ambiance to the show. No, I mean that's we, we are in Industry City in Brooklyn, and as a city of industry, you know what better place to put your studio than someplace where they're <laughs> doing all kinds of work. Anyway, so sorry about that. But um, so. In terms of uh, radio, are you using your video transmitter to also send this kind of radio signal, or is it part of like the actual like controller that you're using? So we, we sort of redesigned the radio system from the ground up. So we designed a custom radio system that, that manages all our communication to and from the drone. So there's two primary radio communications with the drone. One is the video signal coming off, and the other one is the control uplink. But then there's sort of an ancillary set of data that needs to come off the drone about sort of you know, scoring and positioning and tracking and, and stats on drone performance. So we integrated all of that to facilitate it. And it's why, I mean, the main thing we did is, you know, you'll see our races and we'll go to Dolphin Stadium, we'll fly around the stadium bowl, through the concourse, down the tunnels underneath. And that, what our system allows us to do is those huge, elaborate, long distance courses through buildings. I mean, that is amazing because like when I go out and fly, I know very well when my video starts to break up yeah. and, and what my limits are. And I have seen concrete as a yeah. big interference. Yeah. And yeah. Well, so how do you get started learning how to race a drone? Because I would imagine that like it's an entirely new set of skills, but it has to start with you kind of learning the controls. But then the, you have to kind of take that, you know, just the basic skills of operating a drone, and take it to that level where you can get through those gates as right. quickly as possible and have the situational awareness to even yeah. know that you're, you know, where the, zone, the drone is in space, right? Yeah. So I think uh, there's two ways, and it depends on how you like to approach things. Uh, I think a simulator is a really great way to start, and um, basically affords you to be able to crash as much as you want without actually like breaking. Wait, anything. are you talking about like a digital simulator of a drone? And exactly, and it where actually you connect, literally yeah. connect a drone. The exact, I mean, there's a couple ways to go about it. If you're just starting off, there's uh, an Xbox controller you can connect to your PC, and then you're able to use an Xbox controller to kind of mimic the same controls. But a lot of simulators, most simulators, actually allow you to use your, the same transmitter that you're using on the field. So it feels as pretty realistic. I mean, there are, it's kind of mechanical, and like physics can't it vary between simulators. But that's probably, I think, the best way. Like, if you spend three to five hours on that, you'll be a competent, like you'll be able to race a lap. So one of the challenges of drone racing is people always say to me, how do I get into this? And a year ago, the answer was, well, you gotta order this kit off the internet and you're gonna build this drone and you're gonna destroy it the first time you try to fly it and you have to rebuild it. And it was just awful. Like you didn't want to send someone down that path. So, so we fun. actually built a simulator <laughs> at DRL. So it's free on our website. You can download it. You oh, can play cool. it with an Xbox or PlayStation controller or if you have a drone controller, you can plug it in. And it teaches you how to fly a racing drone. So we spent a lot of time with NASA engineers helping us with a physics engine to make it really true to life. So if you spend a couple hours on our sim, you will, you will be able to fly a drone. And this is actually how I learned to fly a racing drone. I destroyed a drone and our engineers were like, we're, we're not gonna do this. <laughs> Let's come up with a better way. We made the game and then I flew it for a couple hours and suddenly I could fly a drone. Um, and we've actually taken it to the next level. So um, we did a contest last fall where we invited anyone in the US to download the sim and try out. We had over 100,000 people download the sim and they could all try out online. And then we took the top 24 people and held a live eSport event. And the winner of that eSport event, so playing the game against each other, got a contract to fly in the league. So he actually got a 75 grand a year contract. Wow. He became a pro drone pilot, and he's traveling around the world with us. So we went from sort of gamer to pro drone pilot. And it's proving this sort of, you can learn in the game and then translate those skills to real life, even at a professional level. That's amazing, right? The fact that, I mean, there's that, right? There's the, the, the training that can be digital. Yeah. And then you take it into real life. Yeah. But then also, it's like, you can be a pro drone pilot. Yeah. Like that's a, that to me, that's like kind of mind blowing because this didn't exist five years ago. By way of gaming. Like too. by so way of like, gaming. It's yeah. next level, you know, it's right. like, yeah. oh, I'm a prof professional gamer and now I'm a professional drone pilot. Right. People yeah. love it because like you were talking about the sport before seeming like kind of like a video game. Like people call drone racing the real life video game. Right. And we know from feedback, our audiences love the fact that like you blur that line between the digital and the real. You have a real life event that looks like a video game 
You have a video game that trades you for a real life event. Right. Like it's just all the things we imagine growing up. What about like, spectators? Movies. So we have spectators at our event. We've kept our events pretty tight from a spectator's perspective so far. Yeah. Honestly, because you know we reached over 30 million people on broadcast last year. Right. We even if we pack 10,000 people in an arena, we're reaching 10,000 people versus 30 million. Right. But it is really cool live because the drones are loud, they're fast. We fly them really close to the audience. We give the audience goggles. You can pull on a pair of goggles and tune into your favorite pilot and yeah. see what that pilot sees during the racing. See, that's cool, right? Yeah. So that's the you know, I mean. That's sort of where the next level of auto racing has been. We've been sort of, you know, brainstorming that for how many years, right? Yeah. Talking about how you can make auto racing better. And drone racing kind of leapfrogged that yeah. and is doing that kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. What, where, where can you see it on uh, broadcast? So it's, it's on ESPN uh, in uh, North America. So anyone with ESPN, tune in. The actual the, uh, 2017 season starts June 20th at 8 p.m. So tune in, check it out beginning of a new season, bigger courses, faster drones, it's gonna be awesome. So when you say uh, faster drones, I'm really excited to find out more about, you have this huge announcement. Yeah, yeah, we're announcing the drone that we're gonna be using this season. Uh, it's a huge leap from our old drone. Um, it's called the Racer 3. Um, so it is an all carbon fiber drone. Um, it has a sort of stealth inspired shell on the outside. It is uh, more powerful, it's faster, um, you know, it goes from zero to 80 in less than a, less than a second. I mean, it's just unbelievable <laughs> how fast this thing goes. Um, and, it's, and it was really designed to elevate the performance of the racing. Um, and we've already seen it this season, we've done a couple races and it's wild I mean, what the pilots can do these things. Yeah, how are the pilots responding to it? They love it, I mean, they love it. They're, you know, the, we took a lot of feedback on the Racer 2, which was our old drone, and we incorporated it all. Um, we made the radios more advanced, we made all the components smaller, um, it's got a longer battery life, so it just sort of met all these needs, and now it's just unbelievable. I mean, it, it, it's incredible when you give people of that skill level a really powerful tool, and you see how much it elevates the competition. Uh, so you have this drone racing simulator, yeah. and is, that, is the physics in that the Racer 2, your last season drone? Yeah, so right now it's the Racer 2, but when the new season starts airing uh, in June, we're going to update the sim, we'll have the Racer 3 in it, we'll have new technology and the physics will match that so people can start training for the 2018 season on the Racer 3. That's awesome. So yeah. you can expect, even on the simulator, faster races. And Are you going to update maps and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Or? So the new maps from the season will start launching. We're launching some maps in the interim so people can download new ones. It's wild. I mean, both the sim and the physical drone, I mean, the technology moves so fast. We make changes between every race. So we're constantly updating the sim. We're constantly updating the components in the drone. So it's just this like arms race of technology just getting better every time. How are you seeing hobbyists uh, respond to your sim? So they love it. I mean, you know, we recently got voted the top drone racing sim, um, and so it's just, you know, people love it. It gives them a chance. I, it's a few things. One, it's a, it's a great sim. The physics are great. It really teaches you how to race the drone. We have online multiplayer, which means that if we're in different cities, we can challenge each other and do a race. And I also just think it's fun that you see these race courses on TV, and then you can race those courses. Um, and I think that, that makes a difference for people. You're starting to connect it to a real life sport as opposed to saying, here's sort of an arbitrary course that you could go out and race. I've actually played your sim uh, for too many hours that I don't want to mention. And uh, I'd say LA Apocalypse is probably my favorite map. Yeah, that, that's one of my favorite maps too. Um, it's really fun. We also have a sort of an, uh, an open world map called Gates of Hell, which is actually based on a power plant just in Yonkers. Uh, which was one of our preseason races, and we have that course, but then you can go and just explore this whole world, and people love that too. They love the like open world exploration. I remember a bridge specific, there's like yeah, a the bridge. Yeah, the big bridge, yeah, yeah there's a the bridge, giant, and there's like, these factory. tunnels that you can go down into. Ooh, I haven't yeah. found the there's tunnels. There's all these like Easter eggs, these like tunnels you can go into, and like secret passages and everything, and oh, all the maps I love have it. cool little hidden things if you spend enough time on them. Really? Yeah. I guess I haven't spent much time freestyling. I should probably yeah. do that more. Yeah. I've just been racing. I'm number 86 on the <laughs> Apocalypse, just you know, throwing that out there. <laughs> what, is, what is your handle? What you uh, Sice, I believe. Wow. Yeah, everyone needs an FPV nickname. Yeah. Yeah, like all your racers, right? They don't yeah, go by like... they don't go by their real names. They go by handles. And I think that, uh, you know, we talked about how we connect to VR and, you know, all these different technologies, but one of them is gaming. The world yeah. of gaming is very rich into this. And eSports, you know, in eSports, most people play under a handle. They don't use their real name, and the pilots see the same thing in our league. You know, what's cool about this sport, though, for as a newbie, like, who's kind of, like, trying to figure it out, is that just like any other sport, like, they're the moves that you have to kind of learn to look for. Yeah. And you guys on your site have, a, like, kind of a catalog of 
video clips of all the different moves. So I think like this sort of combining the acrobatics with an actual turn that makes you faster is really interesting. Like yeah. this sort of, what, what is it called? Uh, proximity acro. Yeah. Where it's like, it's about where, you know, positioning in space, but it's also about, you know, using the sort of acrobatic move to enhance the racing. Yeah, so we think a lot about, so this is a true three-dimensional race sport. And there's, it's hard to think of any other racing sport that's truly three-dimensional in the way drone racing is. So we try to play into that while borrowing the heritage of auto racing. So we have things like a vertical hairpin turn. So in our, second, our third race last year, which was called Project Manhattan, you, know, you flew through this thing in a couple stories of a building. You had to turn over and then come out the bottom. So just like a hairpin turn, but on its side. And the, the gate was horizontal. And right? then, yeah, yeah. Then we had another thing, we'd thing we called the Adam Gate, which was a dive. It was like a two gates, and you had to dive through it and come out the bottom. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of those kind of things. We make them change altitude, go through tunnels. I mean, is there a connection to aerospace, right? Because if you look at, um, you know, I mean, I sort of nerded out on fighter pilot um, techniques once. Yeah. And there's this uh, sort of energy loop that this guy named John Boyd, who was the fighter mafia guy. If you go get down the, you know, the, the all the way the down the Wikipedia. Fighter, yeah, yeah the, the Wikipedia hole, right? <laughs> yeah. Which, and, 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 you know, great story, but that's, that's like full-size jets and pilots flying, you know, these vectors that are different than drones would fly. Yeah. But is there any connection between, you know, those two techniques or those two yeah, kinds absolutely. of Yeah, absolutely. And, and the pilots borrow moves from jet fighters. That's so cool. some of the moves they do, they think of, I mean, things like if you're flying a drone and you invert and then you pull over, yeah. that's, a, that's a move you can do at a plane and a, and a drone. Um, there's moves you can only do in a drone because you can exert force off all four rotors. So you can sort of make it angle in a way you can't where the plane's got sort of forward momentum. Right. Um, so definitely there is a crossover. And I think there's a real comparison to, if nothing else, just sort of, you know, you talked about earlier, you're, you're flying and like you have to be, you have to be the drone. You have to yeah, be in the absolutely. drone. You're thinking about, you know, you're going to, you have a gate like this, you're going to approach, you're going to turn over, you're going to dive, and you got to pull out of that dive. I think it's a little bit the same way that jet fighters have to think about sort of spatial relations and momentum and what you're going to do. And yeah. similar to planes, drones don't have brakes. So it's not like auto racing, we can go into a turn and be like, oh, I've got a little too much speed, I'll tap some of that off. This is you're going to turn, you have too much speed. You have to find a way to survive. So basically every time that you are overpowered into a turn, you have to overpower out of it. Like that's how I find myself so breaking. So I'm power. Like, yeah, if I'm like going way too fast because Typically, when I'm going way too fast into something is because I, I like overcorrected out of something before. Like just in racing, you're thinking about the next turn more than you are about the current turn. You know, you're like looking at horizon, lines are a little different, but like if I'm, let's say like it's a, a right, left, uh, a left, right, left, I'm like, and I'm going too fast into this one, I have to apply a lot of throttle to hit out of it. So it's like, it's kind of counterintuitive because your brake is also like you just pull back a little and hit a lot of throttle, and that's how you'll get out of it. Where like oppositely, yeah, there's no brake. So there's no brakes. Just... And I mean, I don't know how much you've flown a drone. So drones are Very weird little. in the sense that so you have you have four rotors and they're exerting thrust down. So that gives you lift. So you can rotate. And then when you tip it forward, some of that thrust is pointing back. So then you have forward momentum. And the four rotors can spin independently. So when they spin at the same time, you go up. If the back ones spin faster, you tilt forward. That's tilt. That lets you go forward, and you can do the same thing backwards. There's roll when like, the right side is faster than the left side. But then if you do the opposite corners, you have this thing called yaw, which right. is, you know, that's from flying planes too. But it's very interesting in drone racing, the fact that you can turn the drone on its axis, and then you can apply thrust that way. So you're going into a turn, you can basically cut off power while rotating the drone and then do full thrust right. the other way. To sort of push it against right. the air. I mean, it's, it's physics. But it's its own really unique thing. I mean, it's you could you could make a connection to helicopters. You can make, it, but it's all really different than that. It's its own way yeah. of flying. It, it, it's funny. I'm part of this weird organization called the Explorers Club, and there's all these like astronauts and sure. fighter pilots and helicopter pilots. And I've stood around explaining drones, and they will jump in and be like, "That's like this in that." <laughs> and it's like, I mean, some of them are like, "It's like traveling in space because you have you, once you turn off the power, you still have momentum on whatever axis you are. It's not like a plane where the th the lift is created from the wings, so there's sort of a corrective force to going forward." And it's not quite like a helicopter because you know you're, you you have four rotors instead of one. It's not quite like a jet. So they, it's funny. It sort of borrows from all these disciplines, and it's a unique form of flight. It's a unique form of piloting, which is incredible to watch our pilots who are such masters of it. And it's 
incredibly difficult. I mean, yeah, I, I've yeah. spent so many hours flying and I'm not even like one of the best pilots in the world. And it just like, I mean, I, I am the best <laughs> pilot in the world. Uh, basically, like the barrier to entry, I, I find like you can get out and fly, especially in a field, and it's really satisfying. And then you can kind of introduce new things like race gates. But once you really nail like a, a track or something like that, especially in a sim, if that's how you're starting out, or you go out in the local race league, and you really get this like, I don't know, Johnny FPV calls it juicy, your flow. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, you get this like just momentum where you just are in this, nothing can touch you and you just nail every race and you haven't crashed in like 20 minutes, then that is just, there is no feeling like that. You know, it's just incredible. Yeah, our pilots talk about this sort of tipping point where you go from thinking about flying to just flying, and that's the moment that they say so you feel like Superman or you feel like a bird. Like you actually just get to experience what we all sort of dream about, which is just total free flight. Like you could just fly off the air and go around, and, and they say once you're kind of intuitive with the drone, you can really have that sensation. And it takes hours, it takes a long time to get there, but it's really rewarding. So right now, you can go to our website, drl.io, download the sim, start training, start your career to be a pro pilot. Naturally. I see you're ready. I'm ready. Um, and then uh, June 20th, 8 p.m. on ESPN is the kickoff of our 2017 season, which is called the Allianz World Championship. Cool. You know, I'll be watching, and you know Andrew will be watching. TheDrive.com slash Ariel is your beat. Andrew Seisloff, uh, editor of Ariel. And Nicholas Horbachevsky from Drone Racing League. Thanks for coming in, man. And I'll see you guys next time. That's it for After Drive. Adios.